Um, welcome everybody. Oh, I see there are some students of mine. That's nice too. Um, before I start, I would like to thank you all too for, for being here, for sharing our thoughts, sharing our food yesterday, having our hyper tapas session, which I really loved. And, um, and I would like to thank Michael who um, brought me into this project to ask me to become part of it. So, um, yes, without Michael, all this wouldn't be happening. And um, yeah, we need a little time now to start. Because I, I thought I would, and now that we're talking about hyperculturality, um, work with uh, techniques a little old fashioned, we hope it will work. All right. <laughs> um, the talk I'm going to give you, uh, I called it Connecting Doubts. And that has a double meaning because you could say, Connecting doubts means to have individual doubts from different persons which you then try to connect. Like I could have a doubt um, on my identity and you might have a doubt on culture. But there's another meaning too which would be that um, the process of doubting itself has a connecting power. And that's especially what I'm, what I'm interested in and what I want to talk about. So, that's a little experiment because I'm going to draw and to talk at the same time and I hope it will be productive doubt coming out of that. Can you hear me when I when I speak like that? I think that's loud enough, right? So I cannot. You don't need to hold the microphone. All right. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, from my point of view, one of the main, one of the most important reasons of um, roots of violence in in the world today have to do with uh, what I would call the the will to certainty. I think the problem we have is that. We still have the heritage, um, I think, from Western thinking, uh, which in itself is based partly in Christianity and partly in the dualisms coming from Descartes, um, is the problem of wanting to identify um, the world to gain certainty. Um, if you do that, um, it's a little bit like a policeman uh, saying, you, you are guilty, come to prison. So our concept of of certainty and of knowledge, for that matter, is that we have a subject um, which wants to identify the object and then negates it. So um, when you do that, you don't really get in connection with, with the outer world. You Actually, you try to, to annihilate it by becoming part, part of you. So it ends up being something like this. A is A. It's like I is I, you know. Um, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Um, you could say that also this subject-object relation um, could be understood as a relation between subject and the other. You know? So you don't have another object, but you have another person. Now if you if you try to understand another person and you want to identify it to earn certainty, um, you make it an object. And by that you, you negate it. Right? So it's somehow like trying to, to own the other. So you, you get yourself into the position of the other. trying to inhabit the other and then put yourself into the position of the other or you try to eat the other up and make it yourself. This concept of identity is, um, you could say you could compare it to, to the concept of property, right? So it's 
like certainty is something you own. And um, this idea also has the aspect that if you think you own certainty, you deserve certainty. Right? So if you doubt, if you're uncertain, um, this could lead to the conclusion that somebody has taken away your certainty, right? So you have to get it back. And to get it back, um, it's almost an act of, of violence, of cruelty, because it's sort of a retribution. If you think that somebody is uh, responsible for your doubts, for your uncertainty, then um, again, you get the policeman say, you know, give it back to me. Uh, that concept of identity is a concept, you could compare it to a safe, to a tresor. <coughs> You know, you have, your, you have your, your property, your wealth, and you don't want anybody to, to take part of that. Um, another way to describe that would be maybe with the metaphor of, um, or the story of Odysseus. You know that Odysseus traveled for many years, but actually his, his journey was um, trying to, to come home. So actually, the journey was only a detour to, to get <coughs> back to, you, to himself, to, to the ego. So that would be this kind of movement. Right. You move, but you move to go back to your place. There's, a, there's another story. You could say another um, metaphor would be um, the journey of Abraham. Abraham um, traveled. But he didn't, he didn't go back home, you know. He went to another country, to the promised land. He didn't know what was going to expect him there. Um, and while doing <coughs> that, he changed himself, you know. He went into the otherness and didn't come back. So what I'm interested in and what I think is very important in the um, hyperculturality we have been talking about is that what connects us is the, the doubt, you know, getting away from that violent um, posture of certainty. And that's a different movement. I like to explain it with the aesthetic theory of, of the Kantian um, critique of the power of judgment, where he says, when we, when we experience something beautiful, which for me is almost synonymous with, with doubting, when, when I hear some, I hear a talk, I, I see a performance, I have an aesthetic situation, my, my arrow doesn't go to the object. It's not going to, it's not identified, but the arrow goes back to the subject. Because I'm wondering, how do I find it? What what is that? You know, um, do I like it or, or or don't I like it? So, and then the interesting thing is when you try to find out what you really feel about something, that could be a political situation too. Um, you're honest with yourself. You're not taking the pre-given concepts to, you know, what you could call the pro con whatever posture. You know, being instantly in favor or being instantly against something, or if you don't have the option between A and B, you say, I don't care, which is actually the same as saying I am, I'm against <coughs> it, but without taking even the stakes of the responsibility of thinking about the con contra position. So <coughs> if you try to get outside of the cosmos of the pro, con, whatever posture, um, you will find out that you don't know who you are. As Sandro said the other day, um, we, we don't know who we are. And, um, Many people think that's scary, they think that doubting is uh, you know, similar, or it's the same as fear, pain, <coughs> guilt. It's not the same, because fear and guilt especially has always pre-given criteria. You know, you think you're guilty because some authority, be it internalized, be it external, mm -hmm. uh, tells you you're wrong, right? But when you ask yourself, how do I feel? something, um, your criteria themselves start to dance. They, they, become, they become vivid, you know, they, they, what, what Rancière calls the dis <coughs> disidentification. So you have your imagination on the one hand, and you have your concepts, your words, your understanding on the other, and, and Kant describes it 
as a free play of um, understanding and imagination. If you do that, something different happens. For that, I need to everybody doing? Okay. Now Kant, when you when you read Kant um, he, and he tries to explain what, what the I is, what the subject means, um, he says uh, identity is the I think that always must accompany my representations. So for me to have a, for having a difference between dreaming or uh, being in a psychosis or having an LSD trip, trip um, the difference is, is that you have a camera um, accompanying your thoughts. Right? And I always um, think of it as, as, a, as a plane that will be the eye um, and the vapor trail is the memory you have, right? It's, it's, it's just what you just thought. You know? And then you have the sky, which is the future. You don't know. For identity to, to happen, you need to, you need to connect this point, this point, and this point. Right? To stretch it out. It's an arch. People who, who have Alzheimer or dementia, who don't know what they just thought, um, they are still persons, but they don't have an identity, they don't have an eye. <coughs> because to, to be able to say something, I need to remember what I just said. Right? I have to bind it together. Um, people who smoke too much marijuana have a very short vapor trail, and that's why it's so boring talking to them. Right? Um, <laughs> although they think it's really deep and interesting. Anyway, so um, the more you're able to, to stretch this, what Augustine calls the the distension, the, the, the stretching out of the eye, um, the more you're able to, to, to perceive and to understand. Um, now, the problem with Kant is that he was crucial and um, a little, <coughs> how should I say, maybe body hostile. So, we don't have this kind of life, right? We need to, we need to rest. So, look at some trees. William James, the philosopher William James, who invented the, the term of the stream of consciousness, which then influenced uh, James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, um, said that when we think, uh, you can imagine thinking is a <coughs> bird, right? But Thinking has flying places and resting places. It's not like a plane, it's not, you know, fuel has to be refilled. Um, bird has to rest. So the, the flying places, you could say, is, is the doubting. I don't know where I'm going. The resting places is where I think I'm sure, but it's only temporarily. And what's really interesting is to wonder <coughs> what happens here and what happens here? There is the moment of landing and there is the moment of detaching. Um, William James says that the flying places are the ones where you uh, connect mentally, you put relations into each other. Right? Um, the resting places are more like images you have. You could say the couch potato who watches, um, binge watches, I don't know, uh, Game of Thrones, for example, right? That's the resting place. Um, for doubts to connect, we have to think about those moments, you know, from resting and from detaching. And the interesting thing is, if you take the idea from Abraham, you know, who's going outside into the otherness, he will he will find new things. If 
you ask yourself, going back to Kant, um, how do I find something, right? Do I like it or not? And then you have um, imagination and understanding um, starting to dance, doing the free play. Um, what you will notice is that the area behind the subject area of the, of the common sense, of what Kant calls the sensus communis. Um, when I ask myself how I find something, I don't ask my ego, you know, because that ego, that's the safe to the world concept. Um, it's rather that I ask myself, um, I ask like the humanity inside of me. It's like trying to, to find an answer from an oracle, which I don't know, but which would be humanity. Um, I address I address everybody. This is why Kant says that the aesthetic judgment is disinterested. You know, I'm not trying to win somebody over. Or that. That's not the point. Um, if you really ask yourself, how do I find something? It's not the ego. It's and you could say, um, that in a way we are connected. Um, this is a beautiful drawing from the 12th century from Herod, from uh, Landsberg, who was a nun and who wrote a popular book um, to explain theology and other matters to, to nuns. And this is, the, um, this is painting or drawing from the Pentecost, where you have the Holy Spirit, you know, um, being filled in everybody. Now, this is not going to turn into a Christianity missionary talk, but don't worry. Um, maybe we could say that We don't necessarily need this, you know. I think there's a different kind of connection uh, which um, goes through uh, humanity. That's, that's the connecting doubt. And if we do that, I think we are able to to break through the, the common sense we are in. I mean, now actually that's a different, very weird um, uh, wood engraving, and you probably have seen it many times, which explains the transition from the medieval um, worldview to the to modernity. And um, it was like a paradigm, paradigm shift which took place. Now for paradigm shifts to take place, you need to get outside of the comfort zone, as people would say today, right? You need to overcome your own criteria. That's very difficult to do, because usually um, we, we judge with our criteria. Those are our, um, those, that, that's the, the bad side, that's the instrument, the tools we, um, we need to, to get along in the world. The problem is if those criteria become too fixed, we get back to the will to certainty and to violence for that matter. Um, you can only overcome those criteria if you are willing to endure the, the travel, the journey <coughs> of, the, um, of the uncertainty, of the doubt, you know, like, like the plane or like, like the bird. One important thing to, to overcome paradigms, and if you imagine that this would be like the, the frame of our common sense, is that um, to overcome this, maybe we need to, we need to connect. Now you can imagine that those stars would be like subjects. Only if you if you connect, um, you can you can together um, try to break through that that violent common sense. And maybe what is also very important to to take into account is that when we talk today about about the subject or about identity, it seems to us that it is um, something something we are always had. Well, that's not true. The idea of the subject, the idea of a 
aesthetics, the idea of liberty, of freedom, are um, concepts which were, which were developed, which were invented in a way um, 250 years ago, right? Um, and those <coughs> concepts were developed in the, in the Enlightenment period, that was the time when, when Kant wrote and, and so forth, uh, that was the time of the French Revolution, you know, liberty, um, equality, fraternity. Um, but that was also the time that was the peak of colonization and slavery. So we have to take into account the paradoxical situation that the um, involvement, the genesis of, the, um, of those concepts which are so precious to us today um, were based on freedom was based on slavery. The idea of freedom was based on slavery. The idea of equality was based on, you know, um, annihilating, destroying lives of thousands and thousands of people um, who were treated like, like animals. And sometimes I think that this violent trade <coughs> of, um, of, of colonization, um, which was the economic base for Europe, it was the economic base for um, starting our, our idea of the, what today are the nations, the, the capitalism and all so forth. Um, sometimes I think that it's like archivated, um, like some sort of guilt in, in our identity concept. Because this will to certainty, this coming back to this, to this safe, to, to this trying to, you know, um, to raise the borders, to be not um, menaced by, by others. Um, this, uh, this wish to, to annihilate otherness, to identify objects like a policeman, yeah, killing, killing the other, killing otherness or bringing it back to prison. Um, sometimes I think that that's a movement which maybe has to do with the guilt of somehow know, knowing that this identity concept has been pretty treacherous and pretentious in that it um, imagines of being, being free and detached from, from worldly matters when in fact um, it, was, it was based on very worldly matters of, um, of, of slavery, colonialization and, and so forth. Right. Um, so that's something which seems to be very important for our talking on hyperculturality because <coughs> um, when you think of cultures as, as identities or this, you know, very problematic talking of clash of cultures and, and so forth, um, it's simply like the um, <coughs> multiplication of the ego of certainty to many. So you say, we are, we are us and you are the other and our us has certain features um, and if you don't share those features, um, you have to stay outside or we have to annihilate you. Um, it's the same movement if you have an identity of a person or of a state or a so-called country. It's the same violence, the same, these are the frames and don't change them, you know, these are our criteria and we are right. Um, that's the problem also with the talk of an interculturality in part or multiculturality that you think you could have like <coughs> those frames of identity um, beside one another, of course it will collide, of course there will be a clash of culture if you presuppose them being fixed entities. Right. But talking about hyperculturality instead means that you connect in a way, as if you imagine those as subjects, of, um, of doubting subjects, you know, who have their criteria um, remaining, <coughs> remaining alive, remaining moving, and that through that kind of movement, you, you find a connection. Um, 